Welcome everybody, glad to have you and want to give a big welcome to our live stream audience. We're glad you're joining us tonight and uh, we're moving into Ecclesia, the fifth week. A couple quick announcements for you before we do that. Uh, this coming Friday night is our monthly Erev Shabbat celebration service. So Friday, be here uh, 7 o'clock, but actually we're doing something a little different this Friday. You know, we always do an oneg, a time of hospitality and eating together and fellowshipping, and normally we do that after the service. Well, we're throwing the old curveball. We're doing it before service. <laughs> hospitality team says, yes. So come at 6 o'clock, and you can enjoy all the food that we're going to be serving and have a nice family dinner together with everybody. And then after that, at 7 o'clock, the service will begin, and then we'll have some fellowship afterward, and everybody will be able to go home. So we're eating beforehand. If you come really hungry at 7 o'clock thinking that meal's going to show up, it showed up. <laughs> and you missed it. <laughs> so... 6 o'clock Friday, come and eat. 7 o'clock the service starts. Bring some people with you. It's going to be a great night. The Lord's already speaking a lot of things to do this coming Friday. We're going to have a great time together and look forward to seeing you this weekend. And we have another Shabbat service the following weekend, not here. We're calling it Newcomer Shabbat. For those who are interested in who is B1 Fellowship, what do you guys do, why are you here, who's Jeff, who's Sherry, Sherry's my wife, by the way, uh, who's Jeff and Sherry, and what is this Shabbat thing? We want to invite you to join us for a Newcomer Shabbat. It's on our website. Just go to b1today.org. On the beginning of the page there, the first page, you can click a button and you can register. Now, you do have to register because we need to know how many people are coming. We're going to serve you dinner. We're going to a house. I'll send you the address. We're not publicizing the address because we don't want the whole world to know <laughs> where these people live that are offering their home. <laughs> so when you register, we'll send you an address and tell you where you're going, which is very central to this area. It's very, very local, easy to get to. And we would love for you to come and join us for a Shabbat dinner and you can enjoy that. If you're not part of a Shabbat fellowship already, you're not in a home group already each week, come and join us on this newcomer Shabbat. Maybe you've been to Shabbat before at someone's home, but you hadn't found your home yet. Come to the newcomers one and let us meet you and talk to you and get to know you. And we're going to share the scriptures together, have some good food and fun, and then we can help find the right group for you. So just go and register so we know how many are coming. And that is uh, Friday, February the 11th at 630 and the address, as I say, will be sent to you on that. You can go to the website to get signed up for uh, the newcomer's Shabbat. And finally, for those of you that are online, uh, if this is your time to do tithes and offerings, thank you for doing so. You can go to b1today.org and do that now. And we really appreciate all of the faithfulness of our uh, many people that watch us online. Thank you for being so faithful to the Lord in that. All right, who's ready to study the Word of God? You ready to go? Ready to get into it? All right, here we go. Ecclesia, last week we began to construct a list of what a local fellowship uh, should have as some qualities. Remember that? So we, we asked, what is God commanding? And we started developing a little list. And we said, well, they got to hear from God. That's a pretty good idea for a local fellowship, yeah? They should hear God. Second, they got to work hard. Laziness is not part of the kingdom. Say, lazy? Not part of the kingdom. Not. We got, we got to work, man. We got to put some hard work in. We got to put some effort in. The kingdom does not grow by us sitting on our tush. My wife would be so proud of me choosing that word right there. <laughs> Number three, you got to persevere. You have got to persevere. You cannot give up when things get tough. When you're having a bad day, when the fellowship's having a bad day, when the earth is having a bad day, you can't lay down. You have got to stand up and persevere and push till the end. There is a great reward on the other side. There is a great time coming, but we have to be people of perseverance. Can I get an amen? Y'all hadn't figured it out yet tonight that are here, but I feel like preaching tonight. I'm kind of fired up tonight, uh, and I don't know why, but I really am. So, uh, so work with me, will you? Will you work with me? Just help me out. All right, number four. Do not bear with evil. We learned that last week as we began to dig into the congregation, the assembly at Ephesus. 
that they didn't put up with evil and like evil. And, uh, and, and God doesn't like evil, so we don't bear with it. Fifth, we said they had to be discerning. Ephesus learned. They, they discerned. They were picking. Remember last week? They were picking and listening to who could be one of the, uh, one of the leaders, one of the emissaries, one of the apostles. And it said, and you tested them to find out who was a fraud. God likes that. He wants us not just tolerant of everybody and everything just because they say the right words. You know, tolerance isn't a good word in the scriptures. Tolerance is not a biblical word. It's not a biblical concept. A biblical word would be acceptance. God accepts us where we are, but does he leave us there, everybody? No, because where we are is usually not grand. We come in with all our sin and our baggage and our chains wrapped around us, and God says, I accept you. I'm not tolerating all that baggage. It's got to go. So we have to be discerning when we're talking to people and we're learning about them and who they are. Just because they say something doesn't mean they are something. Are you all hearing me tonight? Six, we learn to remain active in first love priorities. He commended them. I mean, condemned them. He said, look, you've lost your first love. Go back to do what you did in the beginning. So he commanded them, I need you to be in first love priorities. You need to be doing those things. What, what are some first love priorities? How about love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body? That means your whole life is surrendered to him in every way, shape, or form. That's a first love priority. Meaning every decision you're making, every time you're talking to somebody, every time you're dealing with an issue, what are you supposed to be thinking? How do I do this and love God? How am I demonstrating my love for God when I'm having this conflict? When I'm having to make this financial decision? When I'm having to go to work or not go to work? When I'm having to treat my, my spouse or my children in a certain way? How am I demonstrating my love for God in this? First love priority. Love your neighbor as yourself. Treat people the way that you would like to be treated. And you think through it and say, okay, did I really treat you the way that I want you to treat me? Am I really speaking to you the way I'm hoping you will speak to me? I long for the day when you'll just yell at me. <laughs> Apparently, because I'm yelling at you. <laughs> right? So we ask the question and say, okay, what's a first love priority? I've got to love God with everything. And I've got to love my neighbor with everything. In fact, Yeshua made a statement. What was that statement? Those two commands are the greatest commands. In fact, the second, love your neighbor, is as the first. Do you know what that really means in Hebraic thinking? In Hebraic thought, those come because the ten statements that we call the ten commandments actually are big categories of the entire Torah. And what this really means is, on one side of those tablets, it's all about loving God. On the other side of those tablets, it's all about loving mankind. And what, God is, what Yeshua is saying is, if we love God with all our heart, we love everything he commands us to do, and we want to do that. And if we love our neighbor, then we're loving everything God tells us to do and how we treat people, and we're going to do that. So we read and study his scripture so we can stay focused on his commands. And when we follow those, guess what we have? Life. And it's beautiful. And that's what gets us our third, first priority commands. Obey his commands. If we do what his word says, life's really good. The problem we have is we don't always do that, right? And that's what we got to work on. We got to always be submitting so we can work on those first love priorities. The prophet wrote this, obedience is better than sacrifice. Now, that doesn't mean that sacrifice is not required. How many of you realize sacrifice is required, right? If we don't believe in sacrifice, what did Yeshua die for? <laughs> so we got to have sacrifice. But if you had to choose one or the other, God would rather have your heart obedient to him than you choosing to go do a sacrifice. And here's why. This is the subtleness of the scriptures. Many times, we may 
show an attitude of sacrifice. And in that, we're kind of like, look at what I did. Look how I did this sacrifice for you, God. Look what I gave for you, God, which becomes almost a false humility. Do you, you understand what I'm saying? So it's like, am I sacrificing because I'm obedient or am I sacrificing to earn points? If I'm sacrificing out of obedience, then obedience is better than sacrifice. I'm doing it right. And I can take great joy in that because I'm sacrificing something for the purpose of obeying God. Are y'all following me tonight? Obedience is great. Sacrifice is great. But sacrificial obedience is the greatest. All right, so now we come to this next part of the message, which is what tonight is about, primarily. Revelation chapter 2, verse 6. Yet, talking to the, the congregation in Ephesus, yet you have this going for you that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Yeshua loathed the doctrine of the Nicolaitans and the actions, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Okay, so we got to ask ourselves, well, it'd be important to know what he hates. So if he hates their deeds, wouldn't it be good to know what those deeds were? Because <laughs> you really don't want to do those, right? I mean, we want to know, hey, that's what they did. I'm probably going to do opposite. That, that's not a good plan to do what they did. So let's look at a couple key words first about this verse. The word hate comes from a Greek word, mesio. And that means to abhor, to find utterly repulsive. It describes a person who has such a deep-seated animosity that they are literally repulsed and antagonistic towards that thing they hate, they miss so. So this is not a, yeah, I'm not real happy about that. This is, I can't even stand the sight of those deeds. It makes me want to vomit. Are y'all following me? That's how Yeshua feels about the practices of the Nicolaitans. The thing Yeshua hated about them was their deeds, and the word deeds here is the Greek word erga. And erga means works, but it's an all-encompassing word. So it means their actual work, their deed, but it also means their, their beliefs that come out in conduct. So it takes into account the Hebrew concept of what you think is what you are. As a man thinks in his heart, come on, y'all know the scripture, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Exactly right, so is he. And that's what this word in Greek takes in the concept of. It basically says, you're thinking all of these deeds, which means you are those deeds and you will do those deeds which gets into the heart of who we are. We have to watch how we think. Okay, now the name Nicolaitans, it's derived from a Greek word, Nikolos, which is two words compounded together. One is Nikos and one is Laos. The word Nikos means to conquer or subdue. This is where the word Nike came from. The word picture of Nike coming from Nikos is a foot on the throat of a soldier. Hence, a Nike. To conquer, to subdue, but to put a foot on somebody, to conquer them, to subdue them with violence. Okay, that's what the word means. And the word laos is the word for people. So the Nicolaitans conquer, subdue, put their foot on the throat of people. Get the picture? Okay. <clears throat> by, the word, by the way, the word laos is also where we get the word laity from. 
Interesting. I never like that word, laity. You heard that word? You know what that? Why do we use that word laity? Tradition. <laughs> right? We use that word laity to separate people. There's the professional. And then there's the laity. There's them and us. It's a terrible word. It's a word of a conquered people. You are not laity. You are conquerors. You are overcomers. You are of the kingdom. You're called, designed, built by the creator of the universe. You're not laity, everybody. Just get that word out of your vocabulary. It's not a good one. All right. So we read in addition to this, verse 6, about the Nicolaitans. A few verses later, at the congregation of uh, uh, Pergamos, this. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, or Balaam, who was teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before B'nai Yisrael, to eat food sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Likewise, you have those who hold to the teaching of the... Okay, so the congregation at Ephesus, they didn't stand for that teaching. And Yeshua hates the Nicolaitans. But the congregation at Pergamos... Eh, it's not so bad. We're okay with it. So let's look and see if we can discover what this sect of people, the Nicolaitans, okay, who they were and why they're mentioned in two of the congregations in the book of Revelation. They're not mentioned anywhere else in this frame in the Bible, but they're in two of the congregations. That's really interesting when you think about it. It was it was a prevalence here. Seven congregations are mentioned and the Nicolaitans are thrown in two of the seven. We learn a lot from the early Messianic community in the hundred, around the first century and the, and the second century. We learn also from some of the, uh, the early believers that were writing histories of information. And we glean some things about the record of the Nicolaitans and who they might have been and where they came from. A couple of the historians of the second century write that they were descendants, this sect, this Nicolaitan sect, were descendants of Nicholas of Antioch. And he was ordained as a deacon in Acts chapter 6, verse 5. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nic uh, Nicanor, and Tim Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas. Now who is Nicholas? Read the last part of that with me. A proselyte of Antioch. Okay. So here's the Nicolaitans who might be descendants of Nicholas, who was a proselyte from Antioch. How many of you know what Gnosticism is? bunch of you do. For those that don't, just a, a general working definition of Gnosticism is in, within the second century. It was a claim essentially in our, in our context, it's a bigger story than this, but for our context, that salvation, eternal life, could be obtained through a special form of special knowledge. There were some early fathers of the faith that uh, condemned Gnosticism, Origen, Tertullian, Justin Martyr, they all condemned it. Because what Gnosticism leads to is as long as you have this knowledge, you don't have to have any action. <laughs> you don't have to obey anything like the commands of God because you now have the knowledge of God. I know Yeshua is the Messiah, I think I'll have an affair. That's the end game of Gnosticism, okay? Well, this verse tells us that Nicholas was a proselyte of Antioch. So what does that mean? 
What's a proselyte? Well, a proselyte means he was not Israel or Jewish. He wasn't ethnically Jewish. He wasn't practicing the Judaism of the first century. But he decided he wanted to be. So he most likely had been circumcised from a Gentile and converted to Judaism of the first century. And he was now practicing Judaism in Antioch. Not Messianic, not believing in Yeshua, but in the synagogue, like a Pharisee, a Sadducee, what have you. He was a proselyte. He had converted and become Jewish in the first century sense of a religion. Okay? That's who it was. So he was no longer considered a Gentile under the faith of that day. He was considered Jewish. And then comes along Yeshua. And he hears about this Messiah. And now he decides to go for a second trip around the belief system corner and becomes, same word, a proselyte of the way. He becomes a believer in Messiah Yeshua. So now he's been a Gentile who converted to Judaism, who is now becoming a believer that Yeshua, Jesus, is the Messiah. And he's now leaving the traditional Judaism of the first century. He's still practicing Judaism, but he's practicing in the way that Peter and John and all them would with Messiah as being on the earth. Does that make sense, everybody? So that's who he is. He's a double convert. <laughs> now, where did he come from? Well, he came out of deep pagan roots, right? He was a proselyte, which meant he was a Gentile who was practicing paganism of the first century because everybody had a religion back then. There weren't atheists. There were tons of gods to choose from. <laughs> and they were all choosing different gods and idols and what have you. So he was, had deep pagan roots, which, by the way, is different than the other six names on that list. All six of those were already Jewish. He's the only one that wasn't. And we read in Acts 6, going backwards here, what the purpose was, starting in verse 1. Now in those days when the disciples were multiplying, grumbling arose among the Hellenists against the Hebrews, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily support. So the twelve called together the whole group of the disciples and said, It is not right for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. So select, so brothers, select from among you seven reputable men, full of the Spirit and wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this duty. Now, what duty are they in charge of? Go back. It's uh, verse, the first verse there. The widows are being overlooked in the daily support. Which widows? What's the, there's two words up there. Grumbling arose among the who? What's a Hellenist? It's, a, it's a, a, a Hellenistic Jew would be a Jewish person, a Hebrew person, who is more or less adopting Greek lifestyle, Greek philosophy, Greek traditions. As they say, when in Rome or when in Greece. So the complainers are not necessarily those who are full of vigor and faith and holding to everything. The complainers are the Hellenists. And they're saying, hey, we got widows that aren't being taken care of. And we usually focus on the fact of the structure that the disciples were smart enough to realize they can't just serve tables off day if they're going to break the word of God for people. They, ha they only have so many hours in a day. And so that we usually focus on, you know, how they structured it. We don't think about why they're structuring it. They're looking at Hellenists and taking care of them. Now, from our point of this, right, I wonder how many today are walking in a faith very similar to the Hellenistic Jews of the first century, the Hellenistic Hebrews. How many people are in word part of the faith, but indeed still living within the culture? Aren't we supposed to be in the world, but not of the world? You can't pull yourself out of the world, but we're not supposed to be participating in the culture. We're supposed to be called apart, separate. What does ecclesia mean? Those called out ones. Those called out to rule. 
The ecclesia itself is not about submitting to the culture. The ecclesia itself is about changing and transforming the culture. You and I are transformers. <laughs> we should be making the culture think totally different because of who we are. We're not supposed to be Hellenistic. But how many of us are Hellenistic? That's what we've got to challenge ourselves with. We do this, unfortunately even in the way that we teach people to come to faith. What do we do when we want people to come to faith? We give an offer of salvation, eternal life, based on what we call the sinner's prayer. If you just say this prayer, all's well. Doesn't that sound a little Gnostic? All you got to do is say the prayer. Just say it. Now you're saved. Is that really what the Bible teaches? What did Yeshua teach? Very first sermon he ever preached. Do you remember what it was? It's a very simple sentence. The very first sermon he ever preached. He gets water immersed. He goes out into the wilderness. He gets tempted by the enemy. He comes back from that full of faith and vigor and fire and he preaches his very first message. And the very first thing we have recorded that he said is, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He didn't walk out and say, hey, God loves you. I, I just want you to know he loves you. And all you need to do is say this little prayer and you're going to be just fine. Is that what he did? He called them down and said, repent. Kingdom is here. You can't live the way you've been living. You can't think the way you've been thinking. You're part of a system that doesn't work. It's broken, it's wrong, and you're participating. you got to turn the other way, everybody. That's the gospel message. But that doesn't fill the seats up, does it? <laughs> Who wants to be told that? <laughs> I can't tell you how many times people walk out of a building when they hear a message like that and go, oh, I didn't come here to be yelled at tonight. <laughs> I need somebody to encourage me. Somebody needs to cheer me on. Poor little you. I mean, we can't be, it's time to toughen up, everybody. We got to toughen up. No offense. I mean, I'm going to offend you. I mean, it's just going to happen right now. Because I'm going to say this word and my wife's going to be mad at me later, but I'm going to say it. And I'm probably going to be called a sexist or a anti-woman. or I'm going to be called something right now. I'm prepared for it. I get it. I just need you to email Greg at B1 Today <laughs> after this. Okay. But we got to stop being sissies. Now, I know that's a bad word today. It's totally un unpolitical and politically incorrect and all that. I get it. I mean, I grew up in an age where that was okay to use. And I know it's not okay today. But it's only the sissies who think it's not okay. <laughs> I mean, it's time to get over it. We got to grow up, body. We got to get tough and we got to handle, I've been called down to repentance. And in my repentance, I will come flying towards him. And when I do, he's going to not only envelop me, he's going to receive me, he's going to transform me, and I'm going to be endued with power from on high. And that power will then change the culture. But when we don't walk out repentance, we can't change anything because we're just part of the gang. And it's not right. But the Nicolaitans come out of a culture. The Hellenists come out of a culture. They all come out of a culture of compromise.
Acts chapter 2. Acts 3.19 says, Repent therefore and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out. Where did Peter learn to preach like that? <laughs> Peter's sermon told him, he said, Hey, you remember that guy Yeshua 50 days ago? First sermon he preached coming out of Shavuot. Remember that guy? Well, the prophets all said he was the one, but you took him and you killed him. You need to repent. <laughs> he didn't ask him to come say the sinner's prayer. <laughs> he called him to repentance. They said, what must we do to be saved? And he said, what? Repent. He goes on to say, let each one be immersed in the name of Messiah Yeshua for the removal of your sins. And you know what you get when you repent and you're immersed in him? According to Peter and many others in the scriptures, the gift of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. And Peter in verse 39 of chapter 2 actually says these words. For the promise is for you and your children and all who are far away. For as many as Adonai our God calls to himself. Everyone he calls can have this. But this repentance... This forgiveness, it's linked to more than a, a prayer. In uh, Matthew there, we got it on the screen. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive others trespasses, your Father won't forgive you. Your forgiveness from God is linked to how you're going to treat others. You're going to hold a grudge? Wimp. Stop it. <laughs> Stop holding grudges. It does not make you tough to hate people. You do not become better by hatred, hating people. You become better by forgiving people. We used to have a teaching we learned uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. It was, a, it was on a marriage class, and we learned this great teaching. And the man teaching it said this. He said, okay, you're in a fight with your spouse. You're in an argument. So which one of you is going to take the level of maturity and say you're sorry? Who's going to be the more mature one in the relationship? See, we think the more mature one in our relationship is the one that holds tough. I'm right. Well, sometimes it's all about humility. That was a good place for an amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God and Messiah forgave you. Your forgiveness is linked to how you treat others, how you think about others. Mark 11, whenever you stand praying, what? Forgive. If you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. If you're holding garbage against people, you're going to have a tough time connecting to God. I can't tell you how many people struggle with connecting to God and they don't realize it's because they're just mad at the world. They're mad at people they don't even know. And you're saying, like, what do you mean by that? Have you watched CNN? <laughs> people are mad at media people. They're mad at politicians. They're mad at a gossip they heard about on Facebook or something. They're just mad at people all the time, just carrying it around, anger, anger, anger. And then they go to God. Well, dear God, I love you and need love from you. Now, granted, I hate that boy over there. I've never met him, but I do love you, God. Man, we got, to get, we got to get grown up here, folks. We got to start living differently than the world does. Nicholas had an ability. We kind of learned this idea about Nicholas, okay? He converted once as a proselyte. He converted again as part of the way. He came out of paganism, which had multiple gods. What does this tell you about Nicholas on some level at least? He can follow a crowd, can he? Nicholas, and by the way, I, I don't have time to do it justice, but if you study the, 
the city of Antioch. Most likely that's where the Gospel of Matthew was written. He had fled to Antioch, and most likely that's where he actually wrote his Gospel. And in Antioch, uh, to give you a modern uh, understanding of it, how many of you have heard of Calcutta, India? Heard of Calcutta? What's Calcutta famous for on two things? It's famous for two things. What's it famous for? Mother Teresa. And why is it famous for Mother Teresa? Because it's extremely poor. <laughs> Calcutta at the time has been one of the poorest, most difficult places on the planet to live. Extremely crowded, no food, terrible sanitation, and Mother Teresa chose to live there. She could have left many times. She chose to put her life there. For those of you that throw... Uh, stones against everybody's faith that may have been Catholic or of a particular denomination, one day you're probably going to look at Mother Teresa and go, yeah, I missed it on that one. She's pretty good. That's just my opinion. Anyways, Calcutta, you can kind of think about how Cal Calcutta was. That's kind of what Antioch was. When the dispersion happened, it became extremely overcrowded. And they had food shortages, water shortage, all kinds of issues. Pollution, I mean, it was a terrible, difficult place to live. Think about that next time you read the Beatitudes. Think about the city that's being written in, okay? Now, that being said, Nicholas was a pagan. He was a proselyte from where? Antioch. He was part of all that stuff, all that thing, and he was able to kind of be pushed into a direction and kind of flow with whatever was there. Judaism of the first century was very different than all the occult and pagan practices that were going on in cities like Antioch, cities like he had been raised in. So Judaism would have been a breath of fresh air to a guy like him, okay? But most pagans were offended by it. He was not afraid to entertain the idea. <laughs> he was very open to the idea. According to the writings of the historians of the second century, okay, Nicholas taught a doctrine of compromise and separation. And he basically said, there, you did not have an essential need to separate yourself to follow Messiah from the pagan practices you came from. You could do both. You could do some pagan things and still follow Messiah. Now you say, that's, a, that's ridiculous. Can you all think of anything you do or you know people who do? Because I'm sure it's none of us. But could there be any sins that are culturally acceptable that those who say, I practice the faith of Messiah, but I still participate in this? Can you think of anything? You don't have to yell it out. I mean, I'm sure you have a neighbor that does it. <laughs> I mean, that's not us. Except pride, of course. <laughs> Which could be something. Right? So we're not that much far off that. We have a lot of cultural believers Believers in word, but not deed. So we have to think through what Nicholas did. He was able to teach some compromise with the world to make it easier. And it's significant that Yeshua hated the deeds and the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. And he mentions it with these two messianic communities. I mean, it seems as though the doctrine of the Nicolaitans was it was all right to have one foot in both worlds, that you didn't need to be a strict follower of Messiah. And that is the doctrine that Yeshua hated. And what did the word hate mean? Repulsed by. Which is what we talked about. For those, John says, who are loving the world hate God. Did you hear that, everybody? If we love the world, the fleshly world, that thing which draws our hearts, then we actually are showing hatred towards God. 
And thus, these are the things that God himself hates. So the Nicolaitans would lead to a weak, weak faith. And that's the question for all of us. Is my faith strong or is my faith weak? Is the ecclesia strong or is it weak? We've been talking about this on our five weeks now. When you look at the ecclesia as a community all over, there's the individuals that have to challenge themselves and deal with their own questions. But is the overall ecclesia strong or weak? And it's hard to look at the overall picture around the world and call it a strong ecclesia. And I believe very firmly it's because we've fallen prey to the practice of the Nicolaitans, the practice of compromise, the practice of being in love with our culture more than in love with our God. And I believe it has weakened us as the ecclesia. So, should I tell this story? Hmm. Okay, I want to give a couple thoughts here. I was debating whether I was going to, but yeah. We have some extremes going on. On the one hand, we have a basic teaching that The only laws from Scripture that transcend all people are the moral laws. Now, that brings up a big question. Someone or some group has to determine which one of the laws is moral. How do they determine that? Well, they have to be the decider of what morality is. Doesn't that create a little bit of a problem for you and me? Do you want me to determine what the definition of morality is? Or do you think maybe that should be God's prerogative? (laughs) I'm assuming you don't want me to tell you what morality is. Most teachers, congregations, churches, Bible colleges, if they looked at a definition of morality, they would choose the Ten Commandments. Except, of course, keeping the Sabbath. (laughs) Which is in the list. And then they would choose sexual immorality and say, you know, your sexuality needs to be moral. So they would would kind of pick categories of what is moral. But within those, those ten statements, we have the Shabbat. We have to ask ourselves, what is the moral code that that may be upholding or not? And this shows us there's a limitation to the pick and choose morality methodology that leads to compromise. And when it comes to sexual immorality, well, this has proven to be very difficult as well because we're watching many leaders, many teachers, and many denominations choose sexual lifestyles that appear to be pretty opposite of the Scriptures. But they call it moral. What about this one? Here's a weird one. Recently, a research team from Columbia University tested the convergence of neural networks. They combined brain implants, artificial intelligence, and a speech synthesizer to translate brain activity into recognizable robotic words. It connected a brain implant from a human to a robot and got it to understand a word, brain to bot. Is that a problem for for (laughs) y'all? See, the Bible's pretty clear on this. Genesis chapter 1 tells us this. And each one shall reproduce after their own kind. I'm not supposed to make a robot. (laughs) I reproduce people. (laughs) Not machines. We're pushing all the boundaries and we call it good because we say, well, we can fix disease if we do this. So we put a spin on it and we're missing the scriptures. Are y'all with me tonight? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Compromise always leads down a road that will destroy us. You compromise on one little thing. The Bible says it's the small foxes that destroy the vine. 
how in the world can we crossbreed with machines? 50 years ago, not only did we not have the technology, but we wouldn't have even dreamed of it. In the body of Messiah, at least. Now the body of Messiah is like, hey man, we might cure cancer with it. Let's give it a shot. We just justify. Forget the Bible. And the results are a merge of culture and faith. And in the extreme of that, in the extreme, we now have prominent teachers who say, we don't even have to be hitched up to the Bible. As long as we know Jesus, that's all that matters. We don't need the Old Testament. We don't need the laws. We don't need any of that. All we need is Jesus. Don't cut this out of context, please. <laughs> Jeffrey Leonard teaches all we need is Jesus. No, that's not, that's not what he's saying. That's the extreme when we start to compromise, right? We get to a place where we don't even listen anymore. We become total Nicolaitans. And our entire world becomes Gnostic in our faith. And we cannot justify it that way. We have to stand firm that the scriptures are the word of God and we're required to hold them in our life. It's our foundation, everybody. You can't build on anything different. You've got to stand on the word of God. Amen? Got to stand on the word of God. Revelation says this, but I have a few things against you. And this is where he talks about Balaam, Balak. And what are the two things that he talks about? Here's the link of the, the deeds. I've just told you about the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. Now let me tell you about the deeds quickly. One, they're the same as the teachings to Balaam, which were eat food, sacrifice to idols. This is spoken of throughout the, Hebrew, uh, the scriptures, both the apostolic writings of the New Testament and the Hebrew scriptures. It's clearly a problem, and Paul addresses this one. In a, uh, this one is addressed, by the way, uh, in the council meeting in Acts chapter 15, when everyone is told, don't eat food that's been sacrificed to an idol. <laughs> okay? And why would that be a big deal? Why does that even matter? I mean, in our world, we don't, that seems so foreign to us. It's not like, you know, if you go pick up something at the grocery store, you've become an idol worshiper today, right? We don't think in that way. But the Gnostic and the Balaam teachings would say that your flesh can do as it wants because you live in the flesh and you can't stop sinning anyway, and that's why grace is there. So it really doesn't matter. Eat whatever you want, whenever you want. Doesn't matter if it's been sacrificed to an idol. Doesn't matter if it's a biblical diet or not a biblical diet. You get the freedom to do what you want. Jesus died for you, so you don't have to do anything that he did. Are y'all hearing me? You know the old bracelet? WWJD? What would Jesus do? What would he eat? How would he eat? Would he consider the food placed before him as something sacred? Or would he say, well, I don't care. Whatever the culture sends me, I'll do it. You tell me. How would he do it? Would he consider it sacred? Come on. Of course he would. But why do we believe that what he considered sacred, we could consider any way we wish? What made him perfect no longer matters to what could make us perfected. See, we've got to think differently. And how does Yeshua feel about it in the end of days? Well, he tells us right here. <laughs> He's not a fan. <laughs> Are y'all with me on this? Remember what book we're in, right? <laughs> I mean, you kind of feel like I'm teaching out of Leviticus tonight, but I mean, is it, this is at the end of the book, right? <laughs> and this is the end of the days, right? This is to the end times. And he's not happy about people eating food, sacrificed idols, which is a line about the fact that we are compromised. Second thing he says is, hey, <clears throat> um, I'm not a big fan of what the, they teach, which is sexual immorality. He links these together with the Nicolaitans. So the Nicolaitans are teaching uh, sexual immorality. Now let me just give you the definition. There's a biblical definition for sexual immorality, and that is any sexual activity outside of the bounds of biblical marriage. 
What is biblical marriage? According to the book of Genesis, and for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united, joined together to one woman, his wife, and the two shall become one. That's the definition of biblical marriage. Any sexual activity outside of that is biblically sexual immorality. Does everybody understand that? Any. Heterosexual, homosexual, many others. For the children here, I won't say the others. Okay? And this is what the Nicolaitans taught. You can do what you want. I hate to say it, but we're watching pastors live this out and not repent. You got a big pastor right now who's taking a short leave of absence with the girlfriend away from his wife. But he's coming back. Don't worry, he'll be fine. He's just taking a little time off. <laughs> What I'm saying is we are living in a society that even in our congregations many times we are justifying that which we look at and go, how is that possible? But when you begin the road of compromise, it's just a matter of time before you find justification for it. Right? So these activities, are y'all good for a couple more minutes? I'm at the end. I've got eight pages that were good. It's not... Almost done, but I want to wrap up the Nicolaitans tonight. I cannot do it next week on the Nicolaitans. We're moving on, okay? So I want to wrap this time right at the end of it. I want, to, I want to tie a bow on it for you. These activities, food and sex, are two of the biggest biological drives in humans, right? Biologically, they are the drivers of humanity, okay? And so these are the ones that are attacked by the enemy, because they're the easiest to deal with, because they're driven by nature, the way God designed us and built us. So gluttony in the area of food consumption, sexual immorality, anything goes that feels good, and that messaging is what corrupts and destroys the body of Messiah. I've struggled with weight. Many of you know my story on this. Many of you know for years I've struggled with it. And... Uh, when I tell people what I weighed, past tense, because I don't weigh that much now, but what I weighed, people would go, wow, I can't believe you weigh that much. Because I was a solid 40 pounds overweight. That, that's big. And I justified it, not vocally, but obviously, because I didn't do anything about it. Are y'all hearing me? Now, I know right now you're going, man, he is running on my toes. <laughs> well, guess what? I'm running on my own toes. <laughs> and I'll just tell you the truth. I looked up one day, not just at me, but I looked up at a preacher who was, you know, 350, 400 pounds and not a lot taller than me. <laughs> and I thought, is that how God wants us represented? to preach his gospel of life and then overconsume with gluttony so much that health doesn't matter at all. I understand there are people who cannot lose weight. I get that. There's hormones, there's all that stuff. I'm not trying to be insensitive. I'm telling you my story. And I know for Jeff, there's been many a day where I've chosen to be a glutton versus chosen to live holy and healthy. It's part of compromise. I know that feels bad. I love you. <laughs> I love you enough to tell you the truth. We can't compromise. So let me share one last story with you about food. So there was this young man, this is a true story, uh, young man who was seen by a deacon or an elder in his church going into a bar. Now this young man was on the worship team playing music. And the elder went to the pastor and told him what he saw. 
the pastor came to the young man and said, we've had an elders meeting about you and we know that you went into this bar and you're going to have to sit down from worship. We're going to have to go through some counseling and talk to you because you went into a bar and got seen. It's a bad witness. You can't do that. And the young man said, well, I'll be happy to sit down. In fact, I'll be happy to leave when you get that fat deacon off the board. Now, that was probably a little rude by the young man. <laughs> but you got a 300-pound deacon calling out a man who went into a bar. And when further investigation was done, why was he going into the bar? He was meeting a guy there to witness to him because the guy wasn't born again, and it's where he wanted to meet, so he met him there to share the gospel with him. He didn't go in there to drink and get drunk. He was doing the ministry while the deacon was a glutton. Are y'all hearing me tonight? Yeah, I, it's easy to pick on the big ones, the, th the thieves, the murderers, the, the adulterers. We can just throw the stones at them. What about the fatties? <laughs> and I got it, I get it, right? And I can throw stones at this one because I is one. <laughs> I'm not criticizing that which I am not. <laughs> but I am working on it diligently i've been convicted by god to work on it and i'm going to keep working on it and pray that i can succeed in, in this endeavor to to do better about the health that i need to be about but i want you to take this message of understanding every compromise we do leads us to a place where we're not really living righteously for god does that make sense everybody we can't be nicolaitans we got to get tough we got to grow up and we got to get on the line with God. Amen? All right. Okay, so last thing. i got to give you this one thing. Not that. Here it is. Number seven in our little list. Okay? Don't worry about it, Greg. In our little list. Be in the world, but not... All right. The Nicolaitans were not only in the world, they were of the world. So here we are. We're building a fellowship, and one of our critical elements of character has to be, let's not be in the world. I mean, let's be in the world. We have to live in it, but let's not absorb it. Let's not let it be who we are. Amen? All right, let me bless you with a prayer. Father, I thank you for everybody tonight. I thank you for them indulging me and, uh, and hearing my words, and I do pray, God, tonight, that if I spoke any words that were not of you, please first forgive me, Father. And let it fall on deaf ears. But Lord, if I spoke your word tonight in any way, I pray that you would let it settle into good soil and bear good fruit. And we thank you for your teachings in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I love each of you. I hope you know that. Thank you uh, for being here. God bless. And hey, go be firm in the faith. Goodbye, live stream. God bless you guys. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord.